All right, guys, what's going on? Welcome back to Everything College Football Podcast. Today, me and Nick here, we're previewing a mega showdown in week five between Alabama and Georgia. Top five clash is finally on the horizon. Obviously, this is a long awaited contest. Seeing these teams throw down for the first time since, you know, just a couple of months ago in the SEC championship game that was highly competitive, as always, between these two schools. Two and a half point favorites currently are the Dogs. 51 and a half is the total. 7 30 p.m. Eastern time on ABC. From Bryant-Denny Stadium in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, looking at the Georgia offense coming off, you know, a less than stellar outing against Kentucky, a team that, you know, has been stout on defense all year long, um, and they really had the Bulldogs number, though, over there in Lexington. You know, Carson Beck played an all right game. You know, it wasn't bad by any stretch of the imagination. You know, 160 yards, no touchdowns, no picks, completed 62.5%. So far this year, he has just shy of 700 yards and seven total touchdowns. Statistically, though, Nick, you know, this is probably the worst game of his career. And again, it wasn't that bad, but they just didn't seem to have the same confidence throwing the ball downfield. They weren't as in sync as we typically see from Georgia. Um, You know, I'm not concerned one bit um, because I think this offense, especially after, you know, a tough game and a week off, they're going to get back to throwing the football with ease. Carson Beck, of course, phenomenal thrower of the ball. Great when it comes to throwing across the middle of the field. Just has pinpoint accuracy. Love the velocity as well. It was kind of a quiet game when he saw Alabama back in December, though, as well, Nick, where he didn't have any touchdowns and no picks. Less than 250 yards and a loss there that kept him out of the playoff. Beck's going to be looking for redemption in more ways than one, Nick. What do you expect his performance will be like here on the road for the first time in Tuscaloosa? Quite the uncharacteristic performance from this Georgia offense last week up there in Lexington. You know, no disrespect to the Kentucky defense. They are a very strong unit, certainly in the uh, the middle of defense at linebacker. I really like what they have there. But Georgia's struggles on offense were, you know, quite fascinating to look at. They were 5 of 13 on third down, which was certainly well below what they would like to be at. They had 102 yards on 30 carries. When we'll get to the running backs in a second there. And then Beck, he just really wasn't seemed to be dialed in at all. 160 yards passing, 15 of 24. Looked a little uncomfortable. And obviously this game went down to the wire and Georgia got the job done and walked away with the win up there in Lexington. Certainly credit to the Wildcats for hanging in on that one. You know, Beck obviously is an incredibly talented passer, really solid in the pocket. Got arm strength. We've seen it from him at times. He's been very comfortable, but he struggled against Alabama last year. Didn't have a phenomenal seat, phenomenal game in the SEC title game, and it really seemed to be the big story as Georgia's offense really couldn't put anything together, and they were trying to rely on the run in Atlanta last year and getting stuffed on the run, and Beck was not able to bail them out through the air. 68% comp rate, 680 yards passing, seven touchdowns, obviously. Just about as all you can ask for out of your quarterback if you're a Georgia fan. Beck's obviously getting a lot of love, potentially be a top three pick in the NFL draft, maybe even number one overall, depending on how things shake out the rest of the season you can expect Beck to have a strong day against Alabama but how strong of a day is that going to be it's going to be very loud and Brian Denny it's a you know tough environment when this when the Alabama plays very tough teams and he struggled against a defense from Alabama last year that has returned a lot of the same parts obviously some new pieces definitely step in and the secondary has some new faces that may struggle a little bit against Beck I'm very curious to see how that matchup looks I'll be keeping my eye on it and we'll go ahead and look at his receiving group one that is incredibly deep Dominic Lovett and he leads the team with 12 grabs and 155 yards Dylan Bell third leading receiver is a bit of a Swiss army knife you can already you know guarantee he's going to get a couple of touches and some interesting different looks in this game and then Arian Smith a guy who seems to finally be healthy for the first time in his career on a consistent basis this is a guy who can hurt you deep and now this is where my biggest concern is for the Bama defense is this is a guy who typically burns people for big plays especially in these mega contests had a 51-yarder in the SEC championship game, for example. And this is a very young secondary for Alabama against USF. There were some routes that were open downfield. The Bulls just could not connect on them. But that's not going to be the case for Georgia. If you give them some space, they're going to hit on it. Smith, a big speedy option there. London Humphreys only has two receptions so far this year. But he's a good underneath weapon with some speed and you know abilities after the catch. Colby Young, he leads the team with two touchdowns. He's a guy you certainly want to see get more involved. Oscar Delp, Benjamin Yurasek at tight end. I mean, there's are two guys there that can certainly make their impact felt, even though they've not been very productive early this season. It doesn't matter, Nick, because it's going to be all hands on deck, regardless of what the stat sheet says through three weeks. Georgia here has great players. And what are your thoughts on Arian Smith potentially breaking loose? This has been a wide receiving by committee approach so far this season as you have multiple players with touchdown receptions, six of them to be exact, that have receiving touchdowns so far this season. So that's been a really strong start 
for this Georgia offense that they've been able to spread the ball out, really find a bunch of different options to throw to. And when you look at Arian Smith, he's a guy that does have potential to break out. He's been really solid so far this season, 142, 12.9 yards to grab and a score for him. I like this potential. Big play potential is certainly there with him always. Dominic Love at 155 yards receiving, 12.9 yards to grab and one score. Dylan Bell has been really solid so far in his nine grabs. Lawson Lucky has had a big game against Clemson. Landon Humphreys as well had a decent game against Clemson. Uh, Clemson. Kobe Young leads the teams with two receiving touchdowns. He's the only one with multiple touchdowns this moment in time, and he only has five grabs, but been productive in the red zone, a nice red zone threat. I like what they have here. You know, Oscar Delp has gotten a, not as many targets as I thought he would. He hasn't really featured in this offense as much as I thought he would, and Benjamin Yursik hasn't either. I wonder what that's, if they're going to finally, you know, try and pull out the tight end options and give them some targets at this moment in time. I know Lawson is a tight end. He's gotten a few grabs. I want to see if they can get some more tight end play involved. I and mean, that's a big key to success for this offense, considering how strong they were with Brock Bowers last year. Even though he isn't really a prototypical tight end, there still was a lot of production out of him. Yeah, and one thing about this team that doesn't get talked about enough is, you know, their ability to convert on third down. It's all about the defense and how good they are, um, and for good reason. But they've been elite on third downs. I mean, this is a team that's usually 50 to 55% conversion rating. 10, 15 yards out, doesn't matter. They just do such a good job of throwing the football right at the sticks and making big plays. Don't come off the field very often. Looking at this run game, under 170 yards in each of the first three games. In the second half against Clemson, you know, Nate Frazier really helped showcase some good efficiency for them. So they boosted their numbers a good deal there. Trevor Etienne finally getting a lot of touches. You've seen that against Kentucky. Biggest news here, though, is this offensive line, Nick. You know, they pretty much got ragdolled against Kentucky. It wasn't a pretty performance couldn't really establish the run and this is usually where they overwhelm opponents only 102 yards rushing on 30 attempts um and etn got a big bulk of those carries the offensive line you know tate ratledge he's now gone he's gonna be down for about six weeks um that's not great you know dylan fairchild moved to left guard he's a great player for them micah morris he's gonna move to right guard a guy i went to high school with so i certainly wish him great success in matchups like this and he's good in pass protection very good but not having their typical starting lineup could lead to maybe similar against Alabama, who's very good up front themselves. Jared Wilson at center has been phenomenal. We figured he'd be a great plug-and-play asset. Uh, these tackles, on the other hand, I certainly consider this maybe a bit of a weakness if you could find one on Georgia. Xavier Truss on the right side, and then Ernest Green on the left. I mean, these guys are good players, right? But I certainly wouldn't call them elite, and it kind of seems like their ceilings aren't incredibly high. They weren't very good against Kentucky, especially Green on the left side, who was just horrendous in pass protection. Not the ideal week to, you know, get beat again, Nick. I don't think they will. I think there'll be a vastly different performance of a week off against Alabama up front. But even when they're playing their best, the opponent on the other side is also probably going to be bringing their best. So, you know, who do you think might win that slugfest there in the middle? Uh, and, you know, their performance against Kentucky, what were your thoughts? There certainly is a big opportunity for Alabama to dominate against the two tackles, particularly Green, but also Truss, who I was not impressed with against Kentucky either. I thought he had a under, uh, I thought he had a bad game as well being underscored by the fact that Green had a worse game. Green, obviously a younger player, redshirt sophomore, more inexperienced player. He had a tough night against Kentucky, and I think when Alabama can bring a lot of pressure on that side of the field and can cause him some fits, which is certainly concerning if you're this offense. Running the ball-wise, you know, obviously ETN, he's been really solid in terms of yards per attempt, 6.5 yards per carry, 157 yards, but no touchdowns for him. Haven't seen him in the red zone. Nate Frazier's got a touchdown in the red zone while Cash Jones and Branson Robinson have a few touchdowns as well. Robinson has two. Jones has one. Robinson's been more of the red zone back finding himself in short distances they want to use him in the red zone to get some scores this rushing attack was not good against kentucky you read off the stats there i think they'll have an equally you know bad day against alabama because that was the key in the sc title game was that alabama was able to stuff the run and really had a strong day in that regard i think the alabama defense can do that again and when you have weaker tackles that certainly worries you if you're a georgia fan things did not look good on that left and right side now you're playing a very strong physical pass rush that had a really good day against wisconsin this past week and just because you say the rushing attack will be sluggish, which it probably will in matchups like this, they typically are. That doesn't mean pass pro won't be very good for them. So this offense will certainly still be able to click. Moving to the Alabama offense, starting with Jalen Milrow having a flawless year. Guy I picked to win the Heisman Trophy. I mean, he's got eight touchdowns throwing, almost 600 yards, no picks. Uh, six rushing touchdowns, two each in the first three games. Um, the biggest thing with him, though, is he must not return to his old habits. You know, fumbles, bad reads, forces in the coverage, staying confident in his pockets, not looking to bail out. These are things he's progressed on immensely, Nick, over the last how many ever months. I think 2024, it's really coming to a full steam ahead approach with him not 
you know, doing that, uh, those respective things. If he returns to that in this game, though, you're not going to see the typical Bama offense. You're not going to see him airing it out with a beautiful deep ball. The design QB runs versus Wisconsin, you saw a lot more of those, and they're very successful. Definitely need to see it more in the red zone. I think you certainly will. Um, but this offense, collectively, when they're not making mistakes, they play with great confidence and great momentum. And we finally saw that against Wisconsin. Of course, the offensive line had a big say in that. But collectively, Nick, when they're not making mistakes, and that includes Jalen Miro's bad habits, this team is very hard to stop. But again, if they go back to that, or specifically if he goes back to that, they're going to have a hard time winning this game. This time last year, there were a lot of question marks about Jalen Miro as he had several mistakes in high-profile games, especially against Texas. I believe he had three interceptions in that game in a, in a similar, very high-intensity matchup against a top opponent at, at home at Brian Denny. So far this season, he's been flawless, and he's cut down on the turnovers as he did at the end of last year. Has to continue to keep up that up and make sure to avoid mistakes because he's been really strong so far this season. 67% comp rate, 590 passing, eight touchdowns, six rushing touchdowns, and 156 yards on the ground. That's the big difference difference between Beck and Milrow for me is you have that extra added edge of him running the ball that is just so impossible to stop when he is fully on and running the ball to his full ability he is so dominant on the ground the legs are phenomenal the vision on the field is incredible he is looks really good in the pocket right now as well it's a very balanced attack from Jalen Milrow if he can have a really strong day avoid making mistakes I think Alabama will be in a very good spot because Milrow is having a flawless season so far looking really good looking really comfortable you know, some people are saying that the yards aren't exactly where they want it to be. Some of the yards, you know, they're maybe they're adding a little bit in, in garbage time. You saw it against Wisconsin where he had a big touchdown pass late in the game when they were up by a lot already. Yes, that's fair. And I think there are some concerns about that, how the deep ball hasn't been uncorked as much as you would like. But I think you're going to find a chance to start doing that as the season develops. And if it's, you don't have to rely on it if it's not necessary right now. His intermediate throws have been really good this season. Then fine, keep doing what you're doing and keep building this offense. It's working out so far. Yeah, I mean, I don't really care about numbers being low because right before half, he let a long drive. They also had two turnovers where they had short fields they were able to capitalize on. So, you know, who cares about numbers? It's not always that deep. Look at his receiving group, though. It's led by a 17-year-old true freshman who's been phenomenal through three games. A very consistent player, Ryan Williams, 10 receptions, 285, and four touchdowns. I mean, those were some pretty impressive marks there. Of course, they have a nice trio in their own right. Gurmy Bernard, who's been in this system for a couple of years under... Kaylin DeBoer, Toby Prentice, who's the third leading pass catcher. These guys are all going to have to step up, though. It can't just be Williams. Josh Cuevas had that big touchdown uh, against Wisconsin you know, late in the game. Kendrick Law, maybe he can get on the field. Another freshman and Caleb Odom. So outside of the top three pass catchers, really not sure who's going to step up. Um, but I think that's fine because these are three very good players here. And overall, the supporting cast has really just kind of you know emerged uh, in terms of you know consistency because GM Miller, you know, he's got 265 and three touchdowns rushing. Almost you know, over nine yards per carry. Had a big run against Wisconsin. Had a few late against USF as well. So he's certainly stepping up. He showcased his physicality last year against Georgia. Whatever he was in the game. So, I mean, you know, this is a player that I think can produce well in this contest. And, of course, behind him is Justice Haynes, who hasn't played as much. Only 19 attempts. Didn't really do much against Wisconsin. He did have eight and a half yards per attempt. Only two carries, though. Um, but I think they're confident in his ability as a big-time playmaker. The supporting cast, though, overall, though, Nick, has really stepped up. And I think you're, you know, seeing who's going to be the guys this year. I'm confident in all their abilities to play, you know, spread the wealth type of game from Milro. I really like what the supporting cast may will do. Ryan Williams, obviously, has been the big star so far. Man, what a blessing it is for Alabama that they were able to make sure that he did not commit to Auburn. If they had lost him to Auburn, this offense would be significantly weaker. He's proving early on that he's going to be an absolute star in college football if he isn't already 285 yards receiving, 28.5 yards through grab, and four scores for him. Bernard has fit in perfectly as a transfer. His eight grabs have been really impactful uh, catches so far. 125 yards receiving, 15.6 yards through grab, and one score. Kobe Prentice has looked really good so far. Kendrick Law only has the one grab, but it was a touchdown. I want to see him involved a little bit more. Same thing with CJ Dupree. I want to see if he could potentially be involved more in this offense, as well as Robbie Oots, two tight ends that have not been fully involved, although Dupree does have two grabs. I like what they have in the running back room as well. I think Jam Miller has been really solid. 9.1 yards per carry is a very impressive stat. Three touchdowns for him, while Justice Haynes has 8.7 yards per carry and two scores. So I think the balance has been really solid so far. I want to see them run the ball a little better, I think, in this game. And that's going to be something to keep an eye on is can they have some success against a Georgia running defense, rush defense that is very solid, has been historically very strong in the past couple of seasons. I like where this offense is at, though, for Alabama. I'm very happy with the progress they've made so far this season. I'm very happy with a lot of guys stepping up and making big plays happen. 
and you look at the offensive line for Alabama, you know, I made a post after week two against USF, and it said that if they can knock off the silly stuff and play clean football, they can do a lot of damage. And, you know, we finally saw that against Wisconsin as they get Kalen Proctor back at left side, uh, Elijah Pritchett at right tackle. So they're fully healthy now on the offensive line. Um, they only had two called penalties up front. They had 10, or I think it was more than that against USF. Allowed them to play free-flowing, consistent ball. No called back touchdowns like you saw a few times this year. Great momentum due to it. And you had to talk about the negatives I alluded to with Jalen Milrow. When he's not showcasing those, and this offensive line's also not showcasing theirs, this is a very tough offense to stop, Nick. And that's what it was against USF. Can't get out of their own way. You've seen that numerous times over the last couple of years with Alabama. They finally played a near flawless football game. And that's what you got to do here. You're going to be at home, so you don't got to worry about going on the road. Um, but this offensive line, we're very confident in all of a sudden just alluded to them getting, you know, their full-time tackles back against USF. You know, there's a lot of makeshift stuff on the outside. Tyler Bucker can play his natural position at left guard. Center Parker Brailsford is tremendous. Of course, our right tackle, Jaden Roberts, he's a standout as well. Also had a very strong performance in the SEC title game. So all those things came together full circle for Alabama, Nick, and they were tough to slow down. I was very impressed with what they were able to accomplish. You saw some of the same against Western Kentucky, and what did they do there? They put up 63 points and a lot of yards. When you look at this offensive line, there was some concerns going to the Wisconsin game after the USF game that they could struggle on the road. It was a very loud environment up there in Madison. I was there. It was certainly loud at the start of the game. You worried if they got some penalties were sloppy, that could be a problem point for Alabama. But the offensive line was on point in that game. They really handled that adversity well. They really tr- protected Milrow for the most part and looked really strong, gave some good running lanes. You know, having the, the offensive line be fully healthy, having Pritchett and Proctor back, that's huge. Proctor looked really comfortable at left tackle, had a solid day. Pritchett looked really good as well. Jaden Roberts, Tyler Booker, and Brailsford in the interior. That's one of the best interiors in the country, in my opinion. They've been very strong, very solid. All three of them play really well together. It was just the tackles that were the biggest issue against USF and the two tackles. Now that you have fully healthy tackles, and that seems to be the five that you want to roll with right now, I feel confident this offensive line playing at home. I think the mistakes will be limited in this game, despite the fact that there were a lot of mistakes at home against USF. That was a makeshift offensive line dealing with some injuries. Fully healthy has everyone back. Everyone seems to be ready to go. Get that main starting five out there. I think the offensive line will be just fine. Now looking at the Georgia defense, cut off a game where they struggled against the run against Kentucky. Kind of what you saw last year as well, where the run defense was far from perfect. You know, they never really got dominated by any means, and but they never also showcased their own dominance, you know, on a consistent basis. So they did have some struggles, and you certainly wonder how they will do here where Kentucky was just running straight downhill at them. And they struggled to create many negative plays. Um, of course, they were without Michael Williams and Warren Brinson. I imagine those guys will be back for this contest, and that's certainly big for them because those guys are very aggressive and great at creating plays for them. Tyree and Ingram Dawkins, though, has been their top defender so far at 5 TFL. Christian Miller is phenomenal. Uh, you look at guys like Jordan Thomas, you wonder if he'll play. I, I imagine he will. I think this is a good week for, you know, Georgia to get fully healthy. Uh, Nazir Stackhouse as well. I mean, this is still a very good D-line. They don't have that elite talent. They don't have a Jalen Carter or Jordan Davis, though, by any means. Um, but this is a run defense that should do fairly well in this one. Uh, giving up 170 yards on 45 attempts against Kentucky. They were kind of getting grinded down on. They certainly bowed their chest when they needed to, limiting them to only four field goals. So that's great for Georgia. Um, but if Bama can establish the same rhythm, Nick, with the quarterback run that they possess, they can be dangerous here. And that's where their focus is going to be, is containing Jalen Milrow. I expect Jalen Walker, a highly athletic linebacker. He's going to spy him a ton, especially in the red zone. I can't remember exactly. I think he was doing the same thing in the SEC title game. Um, if not, he's going to do it here a lot because this is a player who can be a big difference maker for you on defense. C.J. Allen, another linebacker who you know leads them in tackles. I mean, this is a guy who is phenomenal as well despite being very young. Raylan Wilson, another sophomore. This is a linebacker group I'm very confident in along with the D-line despite not having a high-end talent. And, of course, Chaz Chambliss, a veteran who's been pretty sound for them so far this year. What do you make of this run defense, Nick? And what do you think of Jalen Walker on Jalen Milrow in open field? This is certainly an interesting matchup between Walker and Milrow in the opening field. Walker's been really solid so far this season. 11 total tackles, one and a half tackles for loss, one and a half sacks for him. He's been a really so- strong player. If they can have him spying, he had success in the SC title game. And they're going to try and run the same sort of similar setup in this game, which would make a lot of sense for me. CJ Allen has been really good top tackler for this team. 15 total tackles, plus a tackle for loss, which I think was 
really good performance from him so far this season. Smell Mundon has 12 total tackles and a pass break of Chaz Chimbliss is eight. Ingram Dawkins has eight. Kristen Miller has eight. Again, this is a typical Georgia's defense where it's by committee approach. Nazir Stackhouse has seven. Damon Wilson has five total tackles. The one that's a big note, obviously, Michael Williams only played in one game, but he has only two tackles in that one game. If he's fully healthy, he's a big difference maker for this defense. Want to see if they run him out there, if he can get fully healthy, because he's a huge part of that defensive line coming off the edge. Want to see what his presence will look like in this game. Now you look at a secondary unit that has tremendous amounts of talent, um, but overall, at times, against tougher opponents, they've maybe been you know prone to kind of struggle against heavy passing attacks. I don't think you're going to see that much of a threat against Alabama here. Um, but there's still some good players. Daylon Everett, Julian Humphrey, you know, his first year as a full-time starter. Everett, or, you know, a guy who's typically been sound against the run, hasn't been as strong as a tackler this year, needs to get back to being consistent. Um, Humphrey, on the other hand, has been great against the run in a tackler. Daniel Harris, is he going to play after, you know, his arrest off the field then against Kentucky? We'll see if that lingers over, but he's played a good amount of snaps for them. If not, you'll be seeing a true freshman at Ellis Robinson get on the field a good bit. Malachi Starks, of course, he's the nation's best safety. I would say this guy is phenomenal against the run, an elite tackler, great athletic ability and coverage as well. You look to him to be a good playmaker. Dan Jackson, on the other hand, he's also been a great tackler. He's not as athletic in coverage, though, so if there's a guy you want to attack, it's probably going to be him in the middle. Phenomenal Georgia secondary, Nick, talent across the board. You know, these DBs coming up and making plays against the run is something you're going to look to see a lot, especially in short yardage situations. That's probably more important than any coverage concerns that there may be because even though they may give up some big plays, maybe in the middle of the field, if they can avoid all busts, I think they'll be just fine when it comes to defending this passing attack. But again, it is important to note the quarterback on the other side can air it out, and he usually puts it on his guys when he does. Certainly important to avoid coverage busts. We saw that in the matchup a couple of years ago in a similar, similarly high-value matchup in Tuscaloosa where Alabama won the regular season in October 2020 where they won 41-24. There were a lot of coverage busts in that game where they got beat deep downfield by Mac Jones. And that is something that you want to avoid if you're a Georgia fan and part of this Georgia secondary this week. Dylan Everett's been really solid. 12 total tackles plus a forced fumble for him. Malachi Starks, incredible asset in the secondary. One of the best players in the secondary in the country, in my opinion, if not the best. I love the way he looks all the way he plays he looks so comfortable 11 total tackles for him plus a pick dan jackson has nine total tackles tackle for loss and a pass breakup he's been really solid Janelle aguero as well has been solid seven total tackles and a tackle for loss while julian humphrey has two pass breakups and three total tackles a really good coverage asset that i've liked what he's looked like on that right side this is a very strong secondary very solid against the run but I think they get beaten coverage. I think there's a bit of a weakness there. That's the big key is can they avoid getting beaten coverage like some secondaries that Georgia's had in the past have had against Alabama, particularly, you know, that SC title game with Bryce Young is one I think of and a couple other examples here and there. Certainly something you want to keep an eye on if you're a Georgia fan. Now we look at the Alabama defense a unit that is also pretty stout in its own right, certainly without, you know, their flaws, but, you know, we'll get to those. We'll start with their defensive line, a group that is incredibly deep. Tim Keenan, Big fan of his. LT Overton completely took over against Wisconsin. He's certainly proven his point to get on the field more, and he certainly will after an effort like that. Uh, you know, guys like Tim Smith as well. And this is an incredibly deep defensive line. You know, Q Robinson is really impressed as a pass rusher early on this season. Maybe he wants to take advantage of some of those uh, potential weaknesses that might be a tackle for Georgia. Great defensive line here. Um, I, I think for them, slowing down the run is going to be ideal. I know Wisconsin had one good drive. USF ran the ball for 200-plus yards. They were having some success running straight downhill against them. But they also had the threat of the QB run. You know, half of their yards and their attempts were from a physical quarterback that seemed to fall forward tremendously. Georgia's not going to have that threat one bit, Nick, maybe in the QB sneak game at the goal line because they did have three rushing touchdowns uh, in the SEC title game. Um, all because of goal line work. Certainly, that's a threat they might lose. Uh, but overall, this is a defensive line that's going to do its job. Damon Payne, another one of those guys that can get involved. Jaheim Otis. I mean, it's a pretty deep unit for the Tide. How do you think they match up against this old line that all of a sudden seems to be in a little flux? Certainly is a big matchup potentially advantage for Alabama here. Tim Keenan's a really good 15 total tackles, three and a half tackles for loss, one and a half sacks for him. LT Overton, 11 total tackles plus a sack for him. He had that play where he absolutely slammed a player down to the ground for Wisconsin. That was a big uh, social media click play. I was really happy about how he looked against Wisconsin. Robinson's really solid as well. 10 total tackles, three sacks for him. Really solid. Tim Smith, nine total tackles. Jamarian Lathan as well has a uh, 
seven total tackles on Demond Payne has three. So, you know, certainly a deep unit. They got a bunch of guys they can rotate in and out. All these guys have been playing really solid. Each one of them has been gotten gotten on the stat sheet, a couple tackles for loss for each of them. Really solid start to the season. And when you have a potential matchup advantage on that left and right side, that could be really solid. If they can get some blindside hits on, on back, stuff the run, make back uncomfortable, certainly could be a successful day for Alabama. Now you look at the Crimson Tide linebacking group, one that has been just phenomenal this season. They've been quite flawless in the middle. Jihad Campbell, a guy who, uh, when he got to campus, was praised for incredible athletic ability. He's been a phenomenal run defender for them. Deontay Lawson has also improved tremendously from where he first started, especially against the run. Justin Jefferson, he has gotten on the field. He's made some big plays, especially against USF before he got ejected. You certainly wonder who's going to step up off the edge, though. Not just Q Robinson, but Yontes Pierre, maybe. Uh, that's a guy you're certainly going to look to. Uh, Justin Okawakwo, will he get on the field any more than he has? I think LT Overton's probably going to step up and be your top edge, though. So we'll see what happens, because they certainly don't have the threat that they've had in the past. Like, you know, guys like Turner and Anderson. Those guys aren't there. There's still a tremendous amount of five-star talent on this roster, especially coming off the edge, Nick. Which ones will separate themselves from the pack? remains to be seen, but these two inside linebackers are as good as it gets when it comes to a tandem. Campbell and Lawson are an incredible duo at the top of the uh, t stat sheet for this defense. 28 total tackles for Jihad Campbell, two and a half tackles for loss, half a sack, Deontay Lawson, 21 total tackles, one tackle for loss for him, two pass breakups. They're really incredible in the middle there. Justin Jefferson has blown me away, blown away my expectations so far, 12 total tackles, one, ta one sack for him. I've been really impressed with the way he looks. I think he's a very strong piece in the middle of that defense. I like this linebacking core. I think you have a really good one-two punch there. I like the way that they're in coverage. I think there's going to be nothing easy over the middle for Georgia in this game. You have a really nice presence there in the middle of the field for Alabama. Now, the biggest concern with the Tide defense, we talked about this coming into the year, and Kane Womack, I thought, would do a pretty good job of sheltering them, but some of these guys out wide have been left on one-on-one -on -one matchups, and they haven't exactly fared the greatest. Damani Jackson came over from USC after being a very poor player and certainly is retooling his game. Still prone to penalties, though, still prone to being a guy who's not a great sound tackler. They're certainly going to look to attack him in a variety of different ways. Zabian Brown, Jalen McWaukwee, uh, you know, two true freshmen there. Deshaun Jones has played a good bit this year, um, you know, as a Wake Forest transfer. This is a very young secondary, Nick. A lot of these guys are new to the program in general in the slot. Devontae Smith has played a lot. You know, he's been a pretty good tackler. He's been sound in coverage. Keon Sab has been making some waves in coverage. And you're also getting a lot of single high looks from Malachi Moore in this, uh, you know, 4 2 5. He's been splendid tackler as a run defender. You know, he steps up in that regard. And, of course, in coverage, he's a complete DB for them. Him and Sab have been a nice safety duo so far this year. Does this youth scare you at all, Nick? Because that's certainly something, again, against the Bulls. They probably could have lost that game if the quarterback puts it on them. Georgia's not going to – they're not going to hesitate. They'll make you pay if you make mistakes here. So I know this has been a big focal point for them over the last week getting prepared for this game. It does kind of scare me for Alabama. I think the secondary could be the big weakness. When you look at who they played so far, you know, TJ Finley was not able to do anything for Western Kentucky. Brown for USF, he overthrew several wide open players. If he was able to put those balls on the target, they could have been deep, long touchdowns. He was uncomfortable. And same thing for Wisconsin, the backup quarterback who came in after Tyler Van Dyke got hurt. He had several overthrows as well and missed easy opportunities and one-on-one -on -one coverage. That does worry me because Carson Beck, he's not going to miss their throws. We've seen he's very accurate and incredibly top talent. So certainly got to be very strong in coverage this week. Keon Sab has impressed me in coverage, right? He's been the best coverage asset. 11 total tackles, two picks in that first game against Western Kentucky, three pass breakups. Malachi Moore, a little bit banged up, but he should be good to go. 16 total tackles, two pass breakups for him. Devontae Smith's been really solid as well, like what he can do on this in the slot. Six total tackles, three pass breakups for him, been really solid in coverage. Damani Jackson, Deshaun Jones also have three tackles each in a pass breakup. They've both been good. Xavier Brown, two total tackles, solid in coverage. The true freshman. This is a concerning part for me, but I think this team will be up for the task. Certainly keep an eye on the secondary. There's going to be a mistake on this defense. It's going to come from the secondary. Someone's going to get beat pretty easily. That could be a big concern if you're an Alabama fan. One of the tail of the tape, the team comparisons. You can really call this even across the board, could you not? But I tried to be as fair as possible to both sides. I think running back to tight are going to get a slight edge. I think Jam Miller's been a real difference maker. While Trevor Etienne's really trying to still get his feet wet for them, even at quarterback, wide receiver. I'll give the Bulldogs the edge there. I think that they're certainly a little bit deeper than the tide offensive line. It seems like right now, you know, they're the team that's the healthier bunch. They're not missing, you know, a superstar at left guard. And Georgia now all of a sudden is. I think they'll be just fine. I'll give the tie the slight edge. And the front seven, you know, D-line linebacker, going to call it even there. I really can't 
you know, justify it one way or the other. And then the secondary, we just alluded to some of the concerns with the Tide. So a pretty easy nod there for the Bulldogs. What do you think about this, Nick? Do you think I gave too many evens, or do you think it sounds about right? I think these are two teams that are extremely balanced across the board. I think potentially maybe you can give linebacker to Georgia. But outside of that, I feel like this is a very even balanced tail of the tape. And these are two incredibly close teams, as they have been in the past. Several of these matchups between Georgia and Alabama have two teams that are just extremely even you know they both are very strong in their respective position groups this is a very strong top five matchup for a reason these are two incredible teams that are very balanced and they really balance each other out we got final thoughts in the prediction keys to the game georgia they'll indeed be better in the trenches but the offensive line really needs to play a great game also need to contain miller's legs for bama stifle the uga run game create third shorts on offense kind of like they did in the sec title game 10-point victory for the Tides, what I'm predicting, you know, certainly a kind of a wild score, but everyone always expects these games to be close, and they not always are. Like, last time they played here in Tuscaloosa, it was close for a half before Bama pulled away. I think you'll see that here. I think Millworld's going to play a pretty flawless game. I don't expect him to turn it over. Might take some unnecessary sacks. He's a big-time playmaker while this offensive line is more so in sync, so I don't think they're going to make any mistakes to hurt this offense, and I think they will play with better consistency and momentum. I think Georgia will be more one-dimensional, and, you know, that's fine. They can play like that, right, because they have a great quarterback. They can certainly put it on you. Um, I just think that this, you know, Georgia offense will be in more third and longs than they would like to be. And, again, they're great at converting those, but here against Alabama, it's not going to be as many gimmies as it would be against, you know, a mid-level SEC team. So I'm going to take Bama to win this one by 10, Nick. I think they'll get enough stops, and I think Miller will make enough plays. Certainly a bit of a wild prediction here. Tough to pick against Georgia coming off of a game like they just played. But it needs to be respected on the other side as well. The other opponent, they also get a week off after playing a much better game. So I'm going to go ahead and take the Tide to win this one by 10. So no pick for me as an alumnus of Alabama. Certainly excited for this matchup between two top five teams in Tuscaloosa. These are the type of games that you really look forward to. As a fan of college football, we look at this matchup history in the last 10 games. Alabama is 8-2 and two against Georgia, including a run where they had won a bunch in a row. Seven in a row at one point before losing the national title game in Indianapolis in 2022. This has been a very dominant Alabama team against Georgia. They've played well in this contest and other uh, rivalry games and other big games at home and on, and on the road as well. Alabama has struggled against some of the top opponents. Or they're very even. I think of like LSU in 2019. I think of Texas last year. But Alabama's had Georgia's number in these big games, which is why it's something that's comforting for me as an Alabama fan as I feel pretty solid heading into this matchup. There's going to be fireworks on this one. This is the game that you're looking for. This is the one that everyone has circled on their calendar to see what goes down here. It could seriously go either way. A, to a true toss-up in every sense of the word. I'm very excited for this matchup. It's going to be a very enthralling, very intense contest. I look forward to seeing who comes out on top. Obviously, the new expanded playoff. The loser of this game, they have the best loss in the country by far. And the pathway is still very much there for them as we kind of shake things out. There's no more elimination games in September. Certainly a great resume loss if you lose this one in a close one if you're Georgia on the road in Tuscaloosa. And I think vice versa if Alabama loses this one in a close one. It's still a phenomenal resume loss considering Georgia will probably go on and run the way with the SC title at that moment in time. A lot to look forward to in this game. Two great quarterbacks, two great defenses. Very excited for this matchup. And one last thing I want to say is... Just because Nick Saban's not here, it doesn't matter. This team has been incredibly undervalued since the preseason started. A lot more people are starting to give the respect to the Tide that you know I've given from day one. Kalen DeBoer is a great coach. Milrow is showcasing great improvements, and I felt like him and DeBoer would be a great pairing. And so far, it's paying off. And I best believe this game plan is going to be rock solid. I also think the aforementioned Saban will be involved in the defensive game plan just a little bit, Nick. He might not be coaching there, but you can rest assured he still wants to make sure this program's on top, and they still want to get the nod over Georgia. I think those things are all going to be of true the week leading up to this game. I think the week off is going to benefit Bama more so than Georgia, even though they are coming off a game where they're bumped down the AP poll, got outplayed for 60 minutes. I think the other side, it matters a little bit more. I think it does matter a little bit more for their side. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think it's a very fair analysis. Obviously, a lot of big storylines with this game. A lot to see. Top five matchup in Tuscaloosa. You really can't beat it under the lights. Looking forward to this one. Make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe. See you next time.